Hello, my name is Heidi Seibold and I want to talk to you today about um, Open Science Champions and how to become one. Now, when I think about why I started working in science, why I wanted to become a scientist, because I wanted to change the world. I wanted to find new knowledge that the world didn't have before. And I wanted to, yeah, by that have an impact, a positive impact on the world. And I think a lot of people go into science because they have really admirable goals and they have really good reasons why they want to become scientists. And I think this is one important part that we shouldn't forget when we think about open science and being open science champions or science champions in general. So um, this talk is about how to become a science champion and it builds on this idea that a science champion is someone who has admirable goals and um, is in science for a really good reason. And this is why I think um, a science champion is an open scientist, because I think a science champion is someone who is really interested in bringing science forward in moving science into the right direction. And I think that can be done best by working collaboratively, transparently and openly. And so let's talk about like what open science actually means. There's a lot of buzzwords that we hear when we talk about open science that includes open access to papers, openly available code, um, meaning open code in terms of um, both data analysis, but also in terms of um, research software. Then uh, we talk a lot about open data or fair data. I'm going to talk in a minute about um, what this fair thing actually is. Um, and like in general, we have a lot of like other materials as well that we collect as part of the research process, including, I don't know, lab notebooks and um, yeah, documentation on what the goals of the research project are or any grant proposals or other materials that we collect throughout a scientific project. Another word or phrase that is um, connected to open science, although not like to the science part, but more to the teaching part, which is open educational resources. And that's somehow related to open science in the sense that we cannot only make our science itself openly available, but also the teaching material we create as part of our work as scientists. When we think about open science in like a bigger perspective, then I think that we need to think about science communication as well, because when we talk about open access and open data, then this is usually geared towards a scientific community and other scientists. But sometimes we want to translate our science or make our science understandable to other audiences, such as the public, politicians, NGOs, or companies. And for that, we need good science communication and think about how we can phrase our findings, our scientific results, in a way that is understandable and also maybe entertaining to a different audience. And finally, what we hear a lot in connection to open science is the term reproducible research, which means that um, research is reproducible if we can redo what other, others have already done and with that confidently built on what they have been working on. And this I'm going to talk about more as well in a few minutes. So let's um, think about like how can we become an open scientist. So what I want to get started with is by saying um, that you cannot become an open scientist from one day to another or rather um, open science is not binary. So you're not either an open scientist or you're not an open scientist. Rather, most people are open in some um, 
ways and not so open in others. I'm definitely also not on like the far end of the open science scale, but I'm trying to go towards more the open part of the scale um, with every step in my scientific career that I'm taking. Um, and with that, I also want to say to you that you don't have to like do all the steps that we're going to talk about today all at once, but pick something that you like and that you think is easy and then go this one step and maybe another time you can take another step. So there shouldn't be too much pressure to go all the way um, right now and today. But now let's dive into these concepts that I've mentioned before and think, yeah, talk a lot about them a little bit more and try to understand what we could actually be doing here. So one of the core ideas of open science is making data available to others. And this, there's um, two terms that we hear a lot there, which is on the one hand open data and on the other hand fair data. But what does fair actually mean? Fair means uh, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. That means that you cannot only find the data on the internet, but that you can also um, work with it on your computer and are allowed to do that um, because there's an open license um, that comes with the data and um, metadata that explains what the data is about. Now, FAIR data is also a little bit like open science. It's like also more of a scale rather than something binary. And um, there's different ideas how to make data fair or at least fairer, even if you can't make them open, because that's often a discussion that we see, especially in like um, the medical field, for example, where our data is about patients and it's not so easy to make data about patients or people in general openly available. But you can still make them fair by, for example, um, putting the metadata and the information about the data on a website and tell people how they could potentially be allowed to access the data. For example, if they have an interesting research question that could be answered um, with the data. Um, and open data doesn't also not necessarily mean that they're fair because you can put a data set, uh, for example, let's say a CSV or an Excel file on the internet, um, but without any descriptions and any license that tells people what they're allowed to do and what they can do with the data, then it's basically, well, it's sort of kind of open, but it's not really usable. And that's why like the gold standard, I would say, is data that's both open and fair, but um, please don't, <laughs> put data on the internet that shouldn't be there, for example, if it, yeah, if they're very, if, the, if you're not allowed to do that because you're working with patient data where the patients didn't say that you're allowed um, to make it public. Now, the next thing I talk about is open code. And um, there it's often like, people feel really afraid of making code openly available. And it's even less common, especially in yeah more applied domains or like less techy domains, <laughs> I would say, um, to provide, for example, data analysis code. Um, and the steps that I would take here, um, if you work with code and producing um, analyses, or even if you don't use code, but rather a clicking program to um, do your data analyses, then um, yeah, these are the following steps that I would do. Um, first of all, use scripts. So use code, don't use clicking programs because nobody can understand um, tomorrow what you did today if you're just clicking something and then uh, obtaining some results. Um, always use scripts, even in SPSS you can uh, export the clicks that you've made into scripts and then this is understandable to an audience um, later or even yourself later when you should explain to others what you did. For example, your PhD supervisor might be asking questions about the individual steps that you've taken and if you have a script then that's easy um, to explain. 
then the next step would be um, already publishing the code online. And there I would say, well, you probably think like, oh, I'm super embarrassed about putting my shitty code online, but I would say just like do it. It's better than not having the code online because you will always kind of feel embarrassed or most people will always feel embarrassed no matter how good they are at coding. I've been coding in R since um, 2009 and I've published R packages and a lot of my code is online. And like, I still think that my code is not nice and I still feel embarrassed when like I know the people are looking at it. But well, considering that, I think it's better than not having it out there. And even if you did make a mistake, if you're a real science champion and your goal is to um, yeah, bring science forward, then you want other people to find the errors that you've made so that you can um, improve on that. And um, if you've done that, then um, there's a pro tip that I want to give you on your way is using version control. So my life has changed so much for the better since I've been using version control. Version control is essentially um, means that you can look at every step of your um, data analysis, for example, and you can see the changes that you've made over time. But it's also a way to back up all your code. So if, for example, my uh, office burns down today and my computer is destroyed and my second computer is destroyed as well, then I'm not worried about that because all my code is backed up um, in this really cool version control system. Now let's talk about papers. So I mentioned open access before and that it essentially means that your papers are available to anyone in the world. Now what are the possible paths to publishing papers open access because there's not the only one path there's several so people usually think that there's only the first path that's shown at the top here which is publishing a paper in an open access journal and in when you do that then you sometimes have to pay or often have to pay a, an article processing charge and then that means your paper is immediately open access. There's also some or quite some journals that have no article processing charge or, or a very low article processing charges. Um, also in Germany, there's, uh, and many other countries in the world, there's um, the possibility to get support to pay these um, charges as well. So. Um, this is definitely a very good option, but maybe um, your supervisor, for example, or your, your collaborators, they want to um, publish in a very specific journal because it's like the journal where the paper fits the best. And that's maybe a um, traditional subscription based journal where people have to pay to get access. Then um, there's... Uh, Again, there's different paths. And if you publish in a subscription-based journal, you can most of the time use um, self-archiving. So self-archiving means that you either publish a preprint or a postprint. So, uh, preprint is the version of your paper when at the time of submission to the journal. And you most really all, almost all of the um, journals or publishers allow publishing um, preprints, um, even if they're a subscription based journal. And to figure out if you're allowed to do that, you can go to Shepa Romeo, which is a really cool website where you can search different journals and see what their rules are with respect to self archiving and in particular with um, preprints and postprints. And with that, you if you publish a preprint, for example, then a version of your paper, the, the preprint version, is also openly available. Now, many of these subscription-based journals are hybrid journals. That means that they're, they allow also to pay um, article processing charges to them, and then um, your paper will be openly available as well. Um, there's um, the 
deal in Germany that allows you to do that for um, I think Wiley and uh, Springer journals um, and that's um, something that you just need to talk to your institution's library about so your university library for example now if we talk about open materials in general where can I actually publish those um, there's two platforms that I recommend um, usually that are very general so not there's a lot of uh, yeah platforms that are very specific for different um, fields or different projects or such um, these two that I'm recommending here are very general um, which is on the one hand the open science framework um, and on the other hand, Zenodo. I recommend these two because they're not um, owned by a company. If you think of Figshare, for example, that's something that I don't um, recommend because it's owned by a company and this company, again, is owned uh, by Springer. And, um, well, I can only say that open scientists are usually not the biggest fan of these um, big publishing <laughs> corporations and um, I don't really trust uh, Figshare and what their goals are for the future. One thing that I um, do recommend, although it's a company, is um, using GitLab for your version control. Um, and with that, you can also publish uh, materials and make it openly available. And um, that is something that I recommend because you always also have a second version on your local machine as well so no matter what happens with that um, it's going to be okay and also most um, research institution nowadays have their own GitLab instances which make it really nice um, to use as a scientist because you can just use your yeah your institutions um, instance and then you're not dependent on the company anymore anyhow Now, um, you have um, doing a preprint, for example, to archive. don't have to like advertise it talked before about like this connection and reproducible research I want to go into detail a little bit more now so we've um, been here about this so-called uh, reproducibility crisis there's been yeah articles like <laughs> why most published research findings are false or even like a uh, magazine like they call up this idea of how science goes wrong a lot of researchers have um, said in this um, study that that's shown here that we have we do have a crisis and especially when we think about like again our goals of why we research and then really this reproducibility crisis is something that, that should be like make us question um whether we're still on the right path here if we're really going towards these goals or if we're just um with this reproducible um yeah findings whether we're just diluting the that the yeah that is there and what we can do to actually um, not have this problem and then we need to think about like what can we actually do better right so we want to be amazing scientists we want to do really good um, and what are the steps that we need to take to get there? So one of the things that I see as a solution, and that's 
the reason why I think these two topics are always mentioned together there is that open science is the clear step towards um, reproducible research. And that's why these topics are so strongly connected. But other things that I want to mention here is like that we need to work more on being better collaborators and um, having team science as one of the focuses of um, science and like the standards of science. But also something like good organization is really important. Um, and there's one thing that I want to talk about in the end of this um, session, which is pre-registration as well. So let's um, talk about <laughs> good organization. And when I think about like um, this, then I always have like this um, saying in mind that uh, order is for idiots and uh, genius can handle chaos. But then I think, well, let's not pretend we're. Um, and so let's start with like how good an organization um, is done. And it's actually pretty simple. Um, one thing that I recommend is uh, so no sending emails with files. Instead, have good um, sharing systems for your, for your files with your collaborators have a nice file organization and good naming for both your files and your um, codes and so on. So let's start with uh, no sending emails with files. So let's look at this email. So it says, dear colleagues, attached you find the first public version of the <laughs> protocol. Please have a look and do comment. We, also, we can also meet to aggregate our reviews. And then in the attachment, we find um, this document and it seems to be like version one um, from September 2018. And now you can imagine this went out to 10 people, then all these 10 people make their changes in the file and send it back to the first person and the first person is going to be miserable. There's going to be lots of errors happening and lots of confusion going on. If instead you'd have a good system for sharing files and making changes, then this would be much, much easier. Now, if I talk about nice file organization, then this is something that, um, what this could look like. So you have um, different files that have really clear names, like for example, abstract.tech or introduction.tech, where it's really clear what the content is. Um, you have folders and that are shown here in blue, for example, journal correspondence, always a folder that I have in um, my yeah, project folders, um, which just shows the previous um, yeah, reviews and your responses to the reviews. Then there's one folder that's called analysis and that contains the data, the original data and some um, functions. And of course, um, the analysis scripts. And I keep uh, the data and the original data, data separate because the original data is something that I don't want to um, touch again. So I just store it in there and it stays there. And then the clean data and the code to clean the data are in a separate folder. So I, I know this is the part that's going to change over time. Now, when we talk about naming, then um, there's some really simple um, rules that include uh, don't use um, spaces and punctuation and weird, um, yeah, weird, uh, yeah, punctuations. Like in this um, top examples here, rather use something that um, goes well with a natural ordering. So for example, I um, start all my um, slides with the year and the month um, that I used uh, it for a presentation and then some information on what the presentation was about. Um, if you have, for example, figures in a paper, you could also do that by starting with the example here, fig01, and then talk about like what the figure contains. Um, yeah. 
it's simple rules but um they're really helpful and especially if you work with other people as well so um i've had tremendous trouble for example once when someone sent me a file where the file name was using um, Chinese letters and my computer was completely confused about that. Now, the final thing that I wanna talk about is pre-registration. So this is a reasonably new idea, but I think this is something that could really change um, science for the better and solve the most of what we see in the reproducibility crisis. And it's a really simple idea. It's essentially that you publish your research idea before you start collecting data. So you come up with an idea with an hypothesis um, that we you want to test, and that's something that you write down. You write down how you're going to collect the data. You write down how you're going to analyze the data. Maybe you publish even a data analysis plan, and then um, you write that down and you um, pre-register it. There's even another step that you can do is uh, writing submitting that um to that report that you write um for the pre-registration um to a journal this is then called a registered report and that's something that's actually really cool because you're going to be reviewed on the uh, research idea that you have and not on the results but if your registered report gets accepted to the journal and then you do the whole research project and you do the steps that you said you would do, then your paper in the end is automatically going to be accepted at the journal without further review of like the contents. It's just going to be re reviewed again on a uh, basis on whether you actually did the steps that you said you were going to do. So this is actually something that's very cool because you're not wasting all your time with doing this whole project. Um, and then in the end, nobody likes the initial idea, right? And at the same time, it solves problems such as p-hacking, um, where you're by choice or accidentally um, looking at the data for so long that you find uh, interesting results, um, or publication bias, where um, null findings or findings that are don't seem interesting enough, uh, don't get published, although the project was done really, really well. Um, so these are things that we avoid by using uh, registered reports. Um, and that's something that I think would be a big step in improving um, science. And a lot of journals are starting to work with registered reports. And if they don't yet in uh, your community, then this is something that you could and should ask about because um, that's something that we need definitely more of. Now, um, before I finish, I wanna leave you with a few additional tips. If you should actually um, run into a situation where you not only find someone who doesn't work according to open science principles, but even does something that's not ethical, um, then, your institution has someone you can talk to and that someone is called an ombudsperson and um, I recommend to make use of um, these people and um, yeah in the case where you run into things that are unethical and finally I want to leave you with two book recommendations um, first of all the book uh, Science Fictions by Stuart Ritchie which explains really well the whole idea of, um, yeah, the how the reproducibility crisis came along and all the problems that we're seeing in science. And also he talks about the solutions. And then um, another book recommendation is for The Touring Way, which is a really, really cool um, free and open online book about um, data science and in particular, how data science can be done really, really well and reproducible. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much for listening.